to just make sure everyone is keen to um, ask and interact and take advantage of having Steph live around the screen. We're very excited about that. So just our acknowledgement of country first. The Canadian Lee Primary School, which is where I'm sitting today, is proud to acknowledge the Wathaurong people who are the traditional owners of the land on which we learn, play and come together and on which our school is built. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and welcome those that are present here today. And we also pay our respects to the elders of all the lands on which our participants join us from today. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, Sue, and good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to our final Read Ballarat for 2021. I guess we've been so lucky with the generosity of our presenters in the last two years, and we're really excited to see how our group grow and looking forward to continuing to support positive learning outcomes for all our students as we travel along the science of reading and learning path together. And we just want to thank everyone for coming along and supporting our events and joining the conversation. This afternoon, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce our, um, introduce our presenter, Stephanie Levia, all the way from Western Australia. So Steph is the Deputy Principal of Serpentine Primary School, in which is south of Perth in Western Australia, not in central Victoria, as the Serpentine I'm familiar with. Um, she's a level three classroom teacher with a history of, in speech pathology. Stephanie has spent five years in the Kimberley region as the literacy coordinator of a large school district. And she also co-facilitates the very popular Reading and Science Schools Facebook community, which I'm sure many of you are part of, with Natalie Campbell and Jasmine Hall, and is a Western Australia branch for Think Forward Educators. Steph has presented on syntax and grammar for Think Forward Educators, written about change management, and presented about leading change and aligning school practice for the Reading League. Stephanie has generously given her time today to share with us her knowledge on building a school comprehension model. So this will cover how texts are selected and integrated with units of work designed to build student background knowledge, how to use comprehension strategies from questioning the author and reading reconsidered and alongside strategies from the writing revolution. So there's going to be time for questions at the end. So please add them to the chat or you could turn your camera on and ask them. Um, as you can see, this session is being recorded and we'll share it. And uh, welcome, Steph, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Kathleen. I'm just going to share um, my screen now. Sorry. Really sorry about the drill noise in the background. I told everyone not to make any noise <laughs> during this presentation, but that's OK. <laughs> um, Okay, sorry. Okay, I'm going to skip this bit because thank you for such a lovely introduction, Kathleen. <laughs> um, I am at school right now. It is just past, oh, it's 1.30 um, here, which is in the middle of our lunchtime, actually. So I did tell everyone, I'm, my principal isn't in today, so I did tell everyone that unless someone is dying, please do not contact me. So if someone does interrupt you, no, it's pretty serious. So, um, you might also hear some bells, sirens go um, just at the end of lunch. So sorry about that in advance. Uh, okay, so in today, we'll get right into it. Um, thank you for having me, um, Reed Ballarat. Uh, it's very exciting and I um, have watched some of your presentations before that you have shared. So it's an honour to be even asked to be presenting at this. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. So in today's session, um, I will be going over what is reading comprehension? Um, how can we build background knowledge? Uh, finding texts, planning for a knowledge approach as a school, a knowledge-based comprehension model, and myself in Serpentine Primary School, how we have worked together in this area um, to develop this and our future direction. I just need to make a note as well that um, a lot of the content I'm talking about, um, has, it's more practical rather than the sort of theoretical research side behind it, um, more due to timing, and that's, you know, that's a essentially what I'm better at is the practical side. Um, I have, you know, I'm essentially speaking from on experience from what we've done in a school uh, and implementing a lot of the advice that has, you know, come from people before me and people like Lorraine Hammond, Pamela Snow, Reed Smith, um, even, um, some of the, you know, Nathaniel Swain, 
them part of the Think Forward Educators community. I've learned so much from them uh, and many more people as well. And so I do have to recognise the contribution there um, in helping us on this direction. Okay, so first of all, what approach, I just want you to have a think, what approach do you think is supported by the science of reading to develop comprehension? I just want you to have a little think of those um, two approaches have a read about them, have a quick think. And as you do that, I'm going to quickly run out and tell the person to stop drilling. <laughs> okay, I'm back and the drilling has stopped. <laughs> So I hope that um, by having a look at those two approaches um, and thinking what one do you think is supported by the most evidence or the current line of thinking in terms of uh, science of reading, I hope that uh, most of you looking at the topic of what I'm about to talk to today uh, selected number one. Okay, so I guess now I'm going to just go through about how we do that, um, how we've done that as a school at Serpentine, uh, how we've started that process as well. Okay, so a mental model. In terms of what comprehension is, um, it's quite a complicated, uh, quite a complicated process to explain, I suppose. But um, in the Art and Science of Primary Reading by Christopher Such, I think he explains it really well um, from the point of view of this mental model. So, have a think of a particular book or a story you've read many times. So it could be something like Harry Potter. Um, can you give a decent approximation of the plot and characters? probably, if you've read it many times. Can you recall exact sentences from the text? Probably not. And so this tells us a little bit about what comprehension is and in terms of building what we call this mental or situational model. So as we read, we generally uh, forget the exact wording and we remember, but we do remember an overall idea or representation of a story. And so this is this situational model or mental model is continually updated as we read more of a text as well. As the reader progresses through a text, yeah, as a reader progresses through a text, they attend to information and they combine this with the vocabulary knowledge, language conventions, uh, semantic knowledge, and just general and disciplinary knowledge as well to continually update this mental model. Uh, so we add new information. Um, to this mental model as we're reading on. Comprehension is a dynamic process and the mental model being continually refined um, throughout the text. We've also got, um, well, in order to update this mental model, we have to understand syntactic structures and specific vocabulary in a text. These are what we call lower level language skills. Uh, but creating an accurate mental model, we also have to, which also relies, sorry, on higher level language skills. And these language skills are inferencing, comprehension monitor monitoring, and text structure knowledge. Now, the ability to inference heavily relies on a reader's knowledge they bring to a text. Uh, and as the author assumes the reader has a certain degree of knowledge, that's the sign in the background. Uh, so they, the author assumes a certain degree of knowledge in order for the reader to make these connections and make these global level inferences as well. So lower level language skills also support higher level language skills. Uh, so if students ha have a strong understanding of different sentence structures, a cohesive devices such as pronoun reference, they are more likely to be able to make those local level inferences in a text as well. So one supports the other. So as you can see, reading comprehension is made up of many different factors. Uh, it's not just a single skill as such. Um, it is very dependent on decoding and oral reading fluency. So uh, if students are reading below 90 words per minute, uh, their comprehension is going to be pretty significantly impaired. Um, vocabulary, of course, understanding of syntax and morphology, very important. Understanding of text structure, and general and disciplinary knowledge that they bring to a text. So the focus on this presentation is more on that general knowledge and how we can develop knowledge um, for students to develop that comprehension. So reading comprehension, not a single skill, 
I love this Daniel Willingham quote, um, reading comprehension tests are knowledge tests in disguise. So we are not, um, I'm not implying in any way that reading comprehension is only about background knowledge. It's many more um, different factors, of course, but I think what often happens is background knowledge can be quite overlooked and it's not really considered. Um, until recently, I think it's becoming more topical and people are considering it more, uh, but it's very much an afterthought where the comprehension strategies and the skills are always at the forefront of how we're going to focus on comprehension. But we know that student, the knowledge students bring to the table, uh, their social capital, if you like, does have a large impact on their ability to understand a range of texts. So schools spend, and you know, this might be familiar to you, schools spend hours reviewing reading comprehension test results uh, and making assumptions about certain skills students may or may not have. We painstakingly trawl through PAT reading data um, and make generalizations about a student's ability to infer or find the main idea. We get bogged down in this and for two hours of a staff meeting, we're deciding how we're going to improve a student's ability to find the main idea. Is there actually an underlying deficit in inferencing or finding the main idea? Or does the students just not have the adequate background knowledge to truly analyze the text? The ability to make these global level inferences as well is largely dependent on the background knowledge the child brings to the text. Uh, in addition, it's, it's very hard to critically evaluate information, uh, those higher order thinking skills, if we don't have the background knowledge that the, the author assumes. So we really need to change the way we see comprehension. It's not just this culmination of a range of reading strategies taught week after week on this rinse and repeat model. Um, we need to consider it by in the integration of background knowledge and building this knowledge in students right from the early years. Uh, so this means we also need to change the way we see reading comprehension assessment as well. Um, there's a really great article I recommend um, by the Reading Ape, um, the blog, sorry, is reading comprehension an actual thing? It's really interesting and it can challenge some um, quite prominent uh, views and practices in schools about how we're assessing and actually analysing comprehension tests and what are we actually analysing and looking at when we're interpreting these um, reading comprehension tests or, or assessments that say they're, they're assessing reading comprehension. So I um, really recommend reading this blog. It's very eye-opening. Uh, so the role of background knowledge. So only by specifying the knowledge that all children should share, can we guarantee equal access to that knowledge? And that is an E.D. Hirsch quote, junior quote. What currently happens in a school system is disadvantaged children suffer the most from low expectations that translate into what he terms watered down curricula. Uh, so he says that it's important to begin building this foundation of knowledge in the early grades because that's when children are most receptive. And then we can build this on uh, as the years progress. So many schools uh, I've sort of noticed and talked to and worked with who are moving towards the science of reading have let go of their early leveled readers. They might be gradually getting out guided reading, traditional guided reading, uh, which is great. Um, replacing those early predictable texts with decodable readers, fantastic. But this is just only the beginning, okay? So there is still an over-reliance on leveled readers, grouping students, having different groups of students, reading different texts, focus on comprehension strategy of the week, et cetera, et cetera. So what is common in classrooms that really favor the group work and rotations for comprehension work? The strong decoders, the fluent readers, have access to you know, harder texts with more vocabulary and more complicated syntax structures and more complicated topics. Um, and while the weaker students, they might be on decodable readers to improve that decoding fluency, but they're not getting the content and the knowledge that the other students are getting. So it's that two-pronged approach. We need to have a strong response intervention model in a school where these, the weaker students, you know, in terms of decoding, they have that opportunity to practice and refine their decoding skills, but we can't let them go in terms of the comprehension and not ex um, not involve them in more complex texts because then what we start to see is that knowledge gap that Natalie Wexler talks about, I think, and um, over the course of many years um, of not being um, accessing complex texts, not only is there a decoding 
a reading gap, but then there's also what this knowledge gap and that just perpetuates as the leveled readers and the group work continues on through a school. So essentially we want to do comprehension as a whole class model. Uh, and that is so we have equal access to knowledge. That doesn't necessarily mean every student is going to read all of that text. If you have students in, in your class, which is, you know, pretty, pretty common across the, across the board that are weaker decoders, but they have to be able to listen to it, contribute, discuss to it and think about it as well. Uh, so these are some common statements I have actually heard recently uh, and I just wanted to bring them to your attention and talk about them. So we have a school, this is not serpentine, this is <laughs> hopefully, we, um, this is just things I've, you know, heard in the edu world. We have a school focus on critical and creative thinking. And another one, we need to focus on students' higher order thinking skills. It's, there's nothing wrong with wanting our students to be more critical thinkers and there's nothing wrong with wanting our students to be able to answer more higher order sort of questions. Absolutely, we want that. That's um, we want to we want to engage and we want to support critical thinking. However, these are pr pretty empty statements if we're not going to address the knowledge in a school and how it's very difficult to analyze and evaluate and critically reflect on information in text if you don't have a good understanding of it. So if students are struggling to evaluate and crit critically analyze a text, we have to think, do they understand it? Do they have the background knowledge to be able to make these judgments? Do they have the background knowledge to be able to have a position on this topic and really think deeply about their opinion on this topic? Highly likely, if you haven't got a knowledge model in the school, they haven't got that background knowledge to do that. And so we're asking students to critically reflect and um, evaluate from a text without putting in that prior, putting in that background knowledge, putting in the time to develop that. And even as adults, it's a very hard skill to be able to critically reflect on something if you haven't got that prior knowledge. We can't, we, we can't do it. So there, it's just two things to think about when you, if you come across schools that say we target critical and creative thinking or higher order thinking, that's great. But is the knowledge base coming through? Are they supporting that with a strong uh, knowledge approach throughout the school? Um, just mentioned since we've got Reid in the webinar today, um, amazing um, contribution to the research as well. Um, so that by um, Reid, Tanya Seri, Pamela Snow and Lorraine Hammond. Um, so it's a, an article um, that they've recently released in 2021 on the role of background knowledge. Um, so I just thought I'd get a quick snippet there, but it's definitely worth a read. Um, uh, phenomenal amount of work and it just, I guess, supports this idea of having a strong knowledge rich curriculum in a school. Uh, and it was really interesting, um, some of the results they found there too. Uh, in terms of the early years um, or emergent readers even, uh, just in terms of where this fits. Um, so as we know, looking at the reading rope, we want to target language comprehension and also word recognition. Uh, almost quite separately as they develop before we can then really target that reading comprehension. So when I talk about building background knowledge and building, you know, language comprehension, vocabulary, um, that is, that's obviously going to start off more oral. Okay. So listening comprehension, while we also simultaneously target that word recognition through things like explicit phonics instruction and decodable readers as a supplementary resource. So uh, just in terms of how this looks in emergent readers, uh, it's more of a language comprehension model uh, initially. In terms of choosing text for comprehension. Um, so this is for, Oh, sorry if my light's just gone out. It's this funny thing where the lights just turn out if there's no movement, it's very annoying. Um, there's different, for, sorry, choosing text for um, comprehension, there's different um, considerations to be made. So we want to choose texts that teach particular language structures like vocabulary, syntactic structures, macro structure, particularly in the early years. This is, can see a bit of a focus on text selection. We also want to choose complex texts to really challenge our students' comprehension. And in when we're choosing complex texts, we really want to scaffold their understanding, have deep discussions about the texts through careful questioning, discussions, writing opportunities embedded. Uh, and we also want to choose texts to develop background knowledge or knowledge. Uh, and that's a great quote by from Natalie Wexler, that knowledge is like Velcro. It sticks to other knowledge. 
So we need to make sure that our knowledge that we're planning throughout the school is actually um, continuing on building on previous year's topics um, and knowledge units so that um, by the end of year six, they um, go into high school. Um, it's not this mismatch of kind of topics that you've kind of covered, but there is a bit of a rhyme and reason to why we've covered these particular units. Um, so in terms of looking at complex texts, this, um, Doug Lamov talks a lot about using complex texts to challenge students' comprehension uh, from a very young age, so that by the time they get to high school and they're reading more complex novels, um, you know, poetry, Shakespeare, whatever it is, they've actually had uh, quite um, a lot of experience unpacking, analysing complex texts. And complex, the complexity of a text is obviously um, dependent on the age of the child, so a complex text can be um, the faraway tree, it can be Peter Rabbit um, for, you know, five-year-olds. Uh, so it is age dependent, but he breaks up uh, the complexity, I guess, into five different elements. So uh, texts that are archaic texts, uh, texts that are non-linear time sequence, I follow a non-linear time sequence like flashbacks, um, and so novels do that quite a bit. Um, complexity of narrator, so multiple narrators, um, uh, like Wonder, for example, that's quite a common novel done in primary schools. There's different narrators for each chapter. Complexity of story, so where, um, where there's a lot of plot and symbolism and a lot of background and prior knowledge assumed of the reader as well. Resistant text as well, so text assembling meaning around nuances, hints, uncertainties. And a good example, um, I've got a good example of some resistant text coming up in this presentation as well. So actually, if you want more information on this, that's a very quick overview of how to select complex texts. But have a look, um, just do a Google search on the five plagues. And there's a great document that comes up when you search uh, five plagues, um, Doug Lamov, and it just explains all these elements and um, how to choose books based on this for age appropriate as well. So we'll have, you know, pay to one recommendations, etc. Um, also, it, a lot is detailed in his brilliant Reading Reconsidered book, which um, is one of my favourite favorite books in literacy instruction. So now on to text to develop background knowledge. So there's two kind of ways of thinking about this. Uh, you can choose, um, so supporting complementary text to support comprehension of the main or mentor text. For example, uh, if you're doing a novel study um, we've done recently on Blue Bat by Tim Winton, you might then choose some non-fiction text to support the comprehension of this main mentor text. Uh, for example, we've chosen non-fiction text on sustain, um, overfishing, um, development, uh, habitat destruction, etc., um, pollution in oceans, all those sorts of things that can um, that have helped students uh, have a deeper understanding of the messages and the themes in the book as they go along. Um, or Another option to develop these background, um, sorry, to develop background knowledge or devise knowledge units is to get a range of shorter texts linked with a common theme or topic to build knowledge in a particular area, such as women's suffrage, greatest inventions, Australian democracy. You can read the rest. Um, uh, and so this is, um, I guess, a bit of a harder one to do, and it creates a, and it, um, requires a lot more staff kind of collaboration and making sure that. Um, we're not doubling up in years and there's a, um, a, an approach where um, knowledge is building on the previous year, et cetera. Um, but it is something that I think all schools should consider and it's something that we've definitely started uh, in Serpentine and are quite underway with it as well. Um, I'll show you some of our planning documents coming up soon as well. Um, and I think here it's really important to remember that this it's not a theme. It's not like, okay, we're doing oceans for a term uh, and the classroom is going to look like an ocean. You know, it's not about that. It's actually about what do we want students to learn? What do we want them to know after this unit? I don't just want them to um, read or have a vague understanding of ocean animals. I want them to understand, for example, uh, about the issue of overfishing in our in our oceans or um, ways to reduce ocean pollution or um, if it's, you know, that I want them to understand um, what makes Australian democracy, the characteristics of, an of our democracy system in Australia. So having set out exactly what do you want students to know? Um, so it, it goes away from just being a theme to an actually a knowledge unit. 
is it can, um, particularly in early years, it, there's a danger there where it just becomes a theme rather than a, a detailed rich knowledge unit. Uh, so where to find text? This is always a question I always get asked um, and there's no definitive list, but these are some of my um, go-to places. So for non-fiction texts, love read works, the website's free, it's great, um, particularly for those complimentary texts just to, um, or to create a unit around a particular topic. Call Australia, that has some great texts, particularly on units of like sustainability, renewable energy. Uh, we're doing a lot of those topics at the moment throughout the school, uh, and that's a really good one. And it's Australian, obviously. The Parliamentary Education Office website has great um, fact sheets and articles for students, primary school level uh, and high school level, and uh, linking, and that links really well into our HASS um, subjects. Uh, as well. Behind the News, uh, everyone probably familiar with, and kidsnews.com.au has some good articles. Uh, even just the newspapers, if you know they're age appropriate in content. Uh, so fiction, um, the Speech Pathology Book Awards are a really great one. Um, they've got different categories as well. It's something I always go into to have a look what the um, latest awards sort of each year um, they're given to. Uh, of course, the Children's Book Council of Australia Awards. Uh, there are literature spines, like the Talk for Writing one has great book recommendations, as does um, Doug Lamob's Teach Like a Champion, The Five Plagues that I talked about before. So uh, they're just some good ideas of um, where to go to find text or text ideas. So just in terms of our process, um, whole, like um, how we started on this journey, I suppose, um, before I even came to Serpentine, they had already gotten rid of the guided reading model, which is great. So they were already doing whole class comprehension models, a model, and um, it wasn't organized as like a knowledge model, uh, but it was whole class. It had a bit more of a focus on reading comprehension strategies, but um, easier jump to go from that to a knowledge, whole class knowledge sort of based approach to comprehension rather than jumping sort of straight from guided, the guided reading model, I think. It, um, it didn't mean the jump was as significant. Uh, so that, that was definitely, I guess, a, a positive of coming into a school that had already made such um, massive change in terms of whole school, whole class instruction, explicit instruction right across the school and um, consistent practices as well. Uh, so it was actually quite easy to come together and do this next step because everyone um, was all essentially already on the same page. And uh, so we got into sort of um, in the school development days and staff meetings, we uh, watched some webinars. We watched Reed Smith's webinar on the Think Forward Educators website. That was actually more recently, but we brainstormed um, units and knowledge-based units that we could target across the school. And the whole idea was that we wanted to build knowledge um, as um, every year. And so as they were brainstormed, we decided, okay, every, term four, we're all going to do a sustainability unit. But the the year four sustainability unit has to build on the knowledge that we've done in the year three sustainability unit so that as we um, progress and as the students go through um, that they're, they're just deepening in that understanding and learning more and it's using that foundation of knowledge as they're coming through so we do do a sustainability unit across the term four across all um, year one to six year ones is more about recycling and then we go up into um, uh, specific um, overfishing topics and uh, in the year three and four, we're looking at renewable energy in year five and six. Uh, so there's, it's just that kind of, uh, you know, global warming. And um, so it's, it's really the complexity and the depth of knowledge obviously increases as they um, progress, um, but we have those themes going across our school as well to kind of guide the knowledge units. We've also um, developed Aboriginal knowledge units uh, every term or that which will happen in term two um which really ties in nicely with nadoc as well so we're giving students a lot of background knowledge and really having a, a nice length of time to focus on whether it's uh, aboriginal history or aboriginal culture um and arts and focusing on that in a unit um, before nadoc week comes so that um 
they've got that knowledge that they're bringing in the activities then for NADOC um, are becoming a bit more relevant and that um, they understand why they're doing them. Uh, so that's across the school in term two as well. So we collated a lot of information, we put it into planning documents, or we're working through the planning documents now. The planning documents, uh, the nature of them, they are going to change, they're going to be updated, they are working documents um, as we create more knowledge units, as we trial knowledge units and think, nah, this didn't work, that was horrible, we'll get rid of it. That's the nature of what we're doing and it's a big project to undertake um, to go down this pathway, I think. Uh, we have started using core knowledge um, in our uh, early years up to year three. Uh, we didn't, haven't done it in four to six purely because I think um, a lot of the core knowledge units are um, the prior knowledge is assumed that you've done the previous units. And so if you're going to start core knowledge, I would suggest it's better to start in the earlier grades and kind of move it on as the students progress. Um, but then other schools, I think, have just started and done the units and, um, and students have seem to have coped. So um, that's okay. This is just the approach we've going going for. We're not going to do all the core knowledge units. We do do some um, and then we actually create some of our own units as well. So core knowledge, um, it's fantastic. It's explicit, um, complex text with great vocabulary, um, syntax structures, um, and there's fiction. And there's not fiction, all the explicit vocabulary is done for you and the questions are already there. So they've got literal, inferential and evaluative type questions. The idea though, is that we can ask these questions because we've given those students that background knowledge first. Um, so we've kind of adapted this into a EDI model, I suppose, or explicit like, uh, so we do a lot of um, engagement norms with it as well. Um, and a lot of opportunities to pair share um, and those explicit vocab lessons, uh, lots of whiteboard work, etc. as well. So uh, we've also um, done some bit of tweaking where it does actually move quite fast. And we've found there is benefit of doing um, a text. So this is just some of um, one of the units on ancient Greek civilizations that our year two students have done. They've also done the one on ancient, um, sorry, on Greek mythology. Uh, and honestly, the students know more about Greek mythology than I do. It's phenomenal. And uh, I think it just shows you sometimes we can, um, I guess, we need to we need to increase our expectations of our students and what they can learn and what they're able to learn uh, because they are able to learn a lot more than uh, what we actually think they can possibly. Sorry, my light keeps going out, waving my hand around. <laughs> um, so we have done a few modifications to the core knowledge and how we run it in the school in that we do do a text or a story or um, for the, particularly for the fiction ones over two days rather than just the one day. So. Um, because we find that two readings of it just cements that comprehension a bit more than just the one. So day one, we do the explicit vocab instruction. We present the read aloud, you know, the, um, the text, and then we do the more the comprehension questions that are in core knowledge. And day two, we review the vocab, we review the read aloud and the comprehension as well. And then um, we often, we then on the second day, add in the writing revolution strategies to that. Uh, in our critical, we call it a critical reading model um, or a knowledge model. Um, this is our comprehension model. So even this isn't um, the core knowledge, but when we're making our own knowledge units, we've done one recently in year three on invasive species in Australia and looked at, you know, camels and rabbits, etc., and the impact they're having on the environment. Um, we sort of fo we follow this structure. So before the reading, there is a component that is explicit vocab instruction. During the reading, we read the text with the pause points and that has come from questioning the author and frequent checking for understanding. Um, and then after that read, uh, we do embedding writing opportunities. So in years one to six, uh, we, do, we can annotate the text with the students, looking at things like literary devices, techniques, vocabulary, um, structure. And then we usually do the writing revolution sentence level strategies. Um, that goes with the text. Um, years three to six, we do those two as well. Okay, we still annotate a text or there could be a, the writing revolution sentence level strategy in there as well. Um, but we're also adding some more to our range or our repertoire of um, strategies now. So we also include some read, write, discuss, revise cycles. Uh, we might uh, use the ACE strategy to teach students how to answer questions 
uh, and we can do their tech summary through the talk for writing summary um, strategy as well. So the whole idea is that we're implementing a knowledge uh, model, but we are uh, doing that with a lot of low stakes, frequ frequent writing opportunities. Uh, so just as an example, uh, the reason I'm choosing this one because it's one we've just done um, is one that myself and a, my, the year four, five teacher, sorry, five, six teacher created together. Um, and it's based on Sean Tan's text, Tales from the Inner City, really complex text. Um, and it's it's an example of that uh, resistant text, I think, as Doug Lamov explains. There's a lot of nuances and hints and symbolism in there. Um, in um, some very sort of strange themes some people would say um, but when you start to learn more about Sean Tan and where he's come from like in terms of his beliefs and his values and what the book is about um, they start it starts to make a little bit more sense and so the knowledge unit we've created with this text um, it's made of 25 short stories I think and we've just chosen about five of those um, and we're also supplementing them with non-fiction text so students have the deeper understanding of the short story. So for example, the first story is called Crocodiles and all these, it's sort of set in this dystopian future where um, there's really no animal habitat left and it's, um, there's a group of crocodiles, um, I don't know the collective noun for crocodiles, uh, in um, a floor of a building and it sort of goes into detail about how these um, luxurious reptilian beasts are basking in the sunlight while essentially the humans above or the hairless apes in the floor above are going through the daily grind and it's it's uh, a lot of sort of symbolism and metaphorical language in there it's quite complex and so what we do first is back that up, oh, sorry preface that with a week of non-fiction text looking at animal, um, sorry, habitat destruction, destruct, uh, destruction. We looked at the Amazon rainforest clearings. We've looked at overfishing. And so then by the time it comes to actually looking at this text and we ask a question to the group, why do you think the crocodiles are on the 87th floor of this building? We start to get answers like, well, they're there because their habitat has been destroyed because of X, Y, Z. And so the, they are able to critically think and reflect and evaluate and analyze at a much deeper level because they've got all that background knowledge. Um, and it's so interesting to see the change in our writing as well. And I've got some writing samples to show you. Um, once they had that um, deep content knowledge, how they can apply it and they've used it and it's just making their writing so much richer as well. So um, I've already said this, but this is some of the topics we um, the non-fiction articles um, topics that we looked at to embed in this Sean Tan unit um, and that actually then linked into um, a bit more of uh, persuasive argumentative writing as well. Uh, so um, just going through the steps and with this um, particular unit so we explicitly teach vocabulary that's pretty straightforward just got an example there we have the definition um, checking for understanding points, um, sentence stems, pair share opportunities. So we are very explicit with our vocab. Sorry, that come back, it came up a bit differently. We look at the family, the root words, etc. cetera. Um, this template is actually from lifelong literacy that we're using across the school now. Um, we then use a technique called questioning the author, uh, which that is, it's a book. Um, you can also listen to the great podcast um, on Ollie Lovell's um, podcast series, Education Reading Research Room, um, where he interviews uh, Margaret um, Margaret McEwen, and she explains, um, sums up essentially what the strategy is. Uh, it's it's just it's a natural one as teachers we do ask questions but it's kind of thinking about the way we're asking questions and how we can dig a little deeper into helping students scaffolding that understanding so we have to, we make sure the teachers read obviously the um text the, before we give it to the students and identify certain pause points and these pause points are like okay at this point of the text i need to make sure everyone's on the same page everyone understands what's going on because if i go any further i'm going to keep losing students so we put in pause points and in these pause points we're going to put um, some questions and some follow-up questions so 
Uh, does this make sense to you? What do you think the author is attempting to say? And it's all about asking, why did the author do this? Why did the author choose to say this? Why has the author included this? Um, and a lot of, why do you think? Because if we phrase it, why do you think? A little bit less pressure on the students because they're like, okay, it's, there's no right or wrong. What do I think? Uh, and they're just a little bit more likely to have an attempt at answering a question as well, particularly those reluctant kind of speakers in your class and follow up questions. So um, yeah, why do you think the author chose to use this phrase or wording in this specific spot? Did the author explain this clearly? Even just as much, even as simple as going, okay, what's going on here? Let's pair share. Tell the person next to you that I'm going to choose some non-volunteers. I might also do some, you know, through pop sticks or do some cold calling where I'm going to walk around, hear some responses and getting students to, and telling them prepare to share to the class uh, if you're called upon. So setting that expectation immediately that accountability, everyone could potentially be asked to share their response. Um, model how to answer these questions using lots of think aloud. So as a teacher, well, I think maybe the author chose to include this because she's trying to tell us X, Y, Z. Um, facilitate the discussion, encourage students to answer and ask questions. So uh, it's essentially just having those deep um, conversations and discussions uh, about the text and unpacking it uh, without that pressure of read the text, answer the questions afterwards. This is throughout the text and it's in a um, in a um, oral way. It's um, not written so that we're unpacking the text as we're reading it. Uh, because there's no point having a student read entire text without scaffolding any comprehension and then answering questions at the end. Then it's not helping them. It's set up as a test. It's not, it's not set up to help their comprehension. Uh, so these are just some examples of questioning the author. Um, sorry, of questions I've, and pause points I've put in with um, uh, that one of the Sean Tan short stories. It's not going to probably mean much to you without actually um, reading the text, but as you can see, it's quite informal in a way. Uh, so the author keeps using the term hairless apes. Why do you think this is? Why are they saying hairless apes instead of humans? Um, getting them to pair share, have a think. What does that do? What does that do to the, um, the way the humans are depicted in the text? Pair share are some um, non volunteers. Uh, the author uses a metaphor here that the city is just a waiting room, the biggest of all waiting rooms. What do you think this means? So, really putting it, why do you think the author included this? Okay. And I've just put at the bottom there that we, although we do do a lot of um, non-volunteers, um, of course, if there's um, students that want to say something that's, you know, they've got something to say and to share, we can then take um, volunteered responses after that. Okay, and then another part of our critical reading model or our knowledge reading model is linking reading and writing. So we use the writing revolution sentence level strategies a lot uh, embedded in that, uh, in in that comprehension session. Uh, so just, in, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this book, so I'm not going to go through all the different strategies, um, but just as an example, uh, here's one, combine these sentences using an appositive. Uh, we've already, obviously at this point, already taught what an appositive, appositive is, already taught them how to combine sentences using an appositive. So this is just then uh, applying it to the text in class. So I want them to combine these two sentences using an appositive. And another one, complete these sentence stems. This is the because, so, but strategy. The biodiversity of the Amazon rainforest is decreasing or, or declining, that should say, because, so, but. Complete these sentence stems and I say, and these are more subordinate conjunctions. Uh, and so I want them to really think carefully, what does since mean? And I'll remind them, I'll tell them, um, what does although mean? So what am I looking for, for the second clause in this complex sentence? Uh, because the conjunction that is highlighted tells us what bit of information we need to put at the end to make this complex sentence with the dependent clause and the independent clause. Uh, and so reminding them of what the meaning of those um, conjunctions are in order for them to complete the sentence. So it's these low stakes writing throughout the reading model. Uh, it's smaller writing tasks, but more frequently. 
We also implement read, write, discuss, revise cycles uh, in year three and above. This is more of a newer, uh, a, a new thing we've put into place uh, more recently, uh, just to add to that repertoire of strategies we're using in our um, critical reading lessons. Uh, this comes from Doug Lamov's Teach Like a Champion. Uh, so the idea, um, I've got a template coming up soon. You pose a question or prompt, for example, why do you think there are crocodiles in the building? How did they get there? Everyone writes and it's, it's timed usually. Um, it's, it's meant to be quite short and sharp. Then there's a discussion and you share that ideas as a, as a class. You might do some cold calling, pair share, etc. Students can jot down ideas that they've heard during this. So as people are sharing ideas, you want to teach the students, you should be writing notes now because I want you to write some notes or keywords uh, so that you can then add when you write it again, the exactly the same question or prompt and you're writing it again, but you're going to include some of the class's um, feedback and points in your final response. And so it's a little bit different from going um, straight to read, then discuss, then write, um, to giving them a chance to write their notes first, get their thoughts together, then they can discuss it and pair share. Oh, that light is just really annoying. Um, and then having a go at revising that as well. So this is the, just the template that comes from uh, the uh, Teach Like a Champion website. Uh, so even, uh, so this, this is one that we've used with the nonfiction text uh, on the Amazon rainforest. We just want, what are some changes to the Amazon rainforest? We want them to make some notes after they've read the text. We have a quick discussion about it, uh, ask students for their ideas, getting students to jot their notes down, and then they have another go at it. And the whole idea is that there's actually, um, there can be multiple read, write, discuss, review cycles within one lesson. It's not just, this shouldn't take 20 odd minutes, might might take that long the first time you do it. But um, the idea is that it, it's quick and it's frequent, low stakes writing tasks. Uh, and then we did another one uh, using one of the Sean Tan short stories again. So why do you think there are crocodiles in the building? How did they get there? And now we, we are wanting them to draw on their background knowledge of that habitat destruction that they've learned about the week prior in order to answer this question. So I've talked about how we've linked low stakes writing tasks. Uh, into our reading model, but now I'm going to talk about how we actually link it into our writing lessons because we still do a separate writing lesson on top of this. Uh, so it's really, um, and I, I believe it's really important that these still have some link. Uh, so students, and why I think that's important, I think it's important because students have more to write about. They can think critically and evaluate content when they know more about the topic. They have stronger opinions, they have more ideas, um, and more opportunities to apply the vocabulary, okay, both the tier two vocab, but also the domain specific vocab. We want them to use specific nouns, um, particularly in nonfiction writing where it's all about the nouns. Um, so it adds authenticity and it adds sophistication to their writing as well. Uh, so this is why I think it's really important to link um, your reading and also your writing instruction um, together. And just showing some of what I mean by this. So. The improvement in writing content improves. Um, so obviously we still have to teach the mechanics of writing, the structure, the sentence level writing, uh, the grammar. But by having that knowledge focus in your reading and linking that to the writing material, you're giving them more content to write about. And so the depth of the details and their ideas and opinions are going to be a lot richer, more authentic and sophisticated. So this is a year four sample uh, and this um, we're doing some persuasive argumentative writing. And you can just see by this example here just how um, more they can bring to the table. They're not just writing a persuasive text on um, should students have to do homework that might have been done every year since year two. We're actually applying what they're learning to um, the, expect, the writing expectations. Um, another one, sorry. Here, um, this is another one as well, which um, shows you just the depth of the ideas and the understanding um, that they've gained and they're applying to their writing. 
So because of logging, waterway damage, farming, poaching and smuggling, what once uh, was vivacious and buzzing with life will soon be non-existent. This must stop. And so using the vocab we've taught in there as well, which is fantastic. So these are independent writing examples too. Um, just another one there. Um, also, we're looking at uh, where we've implemented single paragraph outlines and multiple paragraph outlines from the writing revolution as well, more so to guide our non-fiction type writing, our information text um, paragraph structure. Uh, and so this was actually on a unit, a core knowledge unit in year two on insects. Uh, it's a great core knowledge unit, really recommend it. The kids absolutely loved it. Uh, and so this is um, just taken, I've just photocopied it. Um, from a student's workbook uh, and they practice doing information sort of style text um, at the paragraph level on different insects based on what they were learning about in the lessons and so and then um, then obviously after they do um, the single paragraph outlines as a class uh, or you know more uh, as a guided activity they then go and create that paragraph from it and it just means that already in year two we're seeing some uh, really decent paragraph writing because we're having that focus on teaching explicitly what needs to go in a paragraph and what makes a good topic sentence, uh, what makes good supporting details, etc. Um, this is actually just a quick, uh, this is this was um, an example of including the because but so activity um, with the twos just um, at that in during the critical reading or the knowledge reading lesson um this wasn't in the writing lesson so they all do it in their writing books uh so it's that frequent low stakes writing as well and just quickly i'm not sure what time i'm up to um just looking at our planning documents like i said these are always being updated and we're changing and we're talking and we're thinking how things fit but this is sort of how we've decided to tackle it they don't always work into perfectly five week units but um we try and do sort of two main knowledge units a term. Uh, so this is each sort of A4 template is one term. So this is year one, term one. So as you can see, we've got um, the core knowledge unit um, uh, for this one. We might also have some complementary texts um, as well that we can read outside of that um, the reading lesson or if we've got so like a bit more time, if the unit's a little bit shorter, we can add to the unit as well. Um, and we've got the vocabulary. Um, a lot of most of them are tier two, but core knowledge does include some tier three vocab. So the ones we pull out to really explicitly teach and practice each day, uh, we will highlight those ones, and that will be more the tier two sort of um, words that can be used across multiple domains. We then have a bit of a, um, how that links into writing. And so the start of year one, we are focusing essentially still on sentence construction, but we can do that in a way which is more linked to stories. Um, and then, you know, for animals and habitats, we again focusing still very much on sentence level construction, but we um, are doing it more with nonfiction material. So we are going to try and write a short, we're going to teach them how to write a short description. Um, and we can do a single paragraph outline as a class. Um, this is the year two an example of one of the terms. Um, we um, just how we're linking there, we're linking narrative writing. Um, and exactly the focus, exactly the sentence level skills that we're teaching. And this goes across the writing, but also across um, the um, reading comprehension lesson as well, because of all the sentence level um, stuff we're incorporating into that. And just the year three one, um, you can see the second unit there. That's one that we've created on introduced species in Australia uh, and the effects of introduced species on Australia um, as well. The um vocabulary we've chosen tier two and tier three because we do want to see some tier three words like domain specific words used in their writing as well um so and then looking at more of an information report and what planning tools we're using for that and what exactly is the focus and it's improving topic sentences um that's a writing revolution thing improving them in three ways um, technical terms so upgraded nouns upgrading sort of common nouns to proper nouns using that um, specific 
vocabulary uh, and exactly the transitions that I want uh, that we want taught as well so very explicit in exactly what we're teaching every knowledge unit and that's the best um, way we've found as a school for us how to plan um, and uh, have that whole school consistency across how we're targeting and that we're not doubling up and that we're building on knowledge and skills um, each year so that is all um, I guess I hope I haven't run too much over time <laughs> Uh, Hi. Question time now. <laughs> uh, thanks, Steph. That was um, really interesting and, and just fascinating and, and lots of new knowledge for me as well. Um, thinking around, you know, building that, that knowledge into teaching. Um, is, if anyone has any questions, feel free to turn your camera on or ask or put them in the chat. Um, yeah, it was definitely comprehensive. Okay, so I was just thinking about um, where would schools start if they're thinking of moving away from that strategy strategy instruction to developing like the core knowledge or that knowledge background? I think with any sort of change, you really need to focus on building your staff knowledge as well and also building their interest. Um, staff uh, or teachers we like if we're in this profession you know we love to teach stuff and actually teaching content and knowledge is really exciting and so i think building that i guess the knowledge of your staff in terms of uh what what are the benefits of going for a knowledge-based approach rather than a strategy approach um it can be a, you can actually build excitement in the school as well um i think great to access uh, one I would highly recommend Reed Smith and also um, Brad um, from Think Ford Educated and Brad, Brad um, Newen's yeah. presentation he recently did one um, and I actually haven't watched his presentation because I didn't want to watch that and then do this because I knew his would be better than mine so <laughs> I said I'm going to watch it afterwards but um, I know from many people that it was fantastic so um, Think Ford Educated um, not at all. I watched it and I think it complements it really well. Like I think they both go, go together. Uh, well now, now I'm going to watch it now, you know, and yeah. I can, um, I'll be fine to do that. But um, so get on to Think Board of Educators. Um, we use their webinars uh, in staff meetings because they're perfect, a perfect length. We've done the vocab one, we've done Reed's one on building a coherent knowledge-based curriculum and I'll definitely be using Brad's as well next year. Um, they're the best, it's free, they're high quality PLs. It's, um, I'd start there. Um, the Knowledge Gap, the book, absolutely, you know, fantastic. And it can also be a bit of a shock factor, which I think is a really good way to sort of uh, get people on board. Um, a book is a hard one just to expect staff to, you know, read teachers are um, one of the busiest, I think, professions. <laughs> so, but the podcast, um, uh, Ollie, I think, it, yeah, Ollie Lovell's um, podcast as well. He's got so many good things on that podcast. Um, the episode with Natalie Wexler. Um, is just brilliant and it really just um, immerses people into that idea of going towards a knowledge-based curriculum. That is what started me on thinking about comprehension really differently was um, Natalie Wexler's book and the podcast. Uh, so I highly recommend getting onto them and just planting the seed, I suppose, and getting, um, getting that um, excitement in the school. I remember when I read the knowledge gap for the first time and that was my real light bulb moment as well. I was walking around the office going, have you read this? You need to read this book. <laughs> like, trying yeah, to get people absolutely. onto it. Yeah. Um, so Sue was asking about whether core knowledge is in, where it fits during the day, I guess, is it in language arts units or history or geography? Steph, my question was just, yeah, yeah. quickly was, uh, because we're, we're looking at them and we've trialled some of the history and geography ones this year. Uh, yeah. Are those units you just had there in your planners for year one, yeah. two and three, are they from the language arts section of core knowledge or are they from the history geography? Section? Language arts, that's all we've targeted um, yeah. so far is language arts uh, just because, um, I mean, we want to sort of embed HASS kind of priorities into our critical uh, reading model, I suppose, knowledge reading model, but um, I think yeah, some of the um, humanities units on core don't align obviously to our Australian curriculum. I know there's a great group with Reed working on creating and aligning them. Um, yeah. Yes, to, I heard um, that little rumour too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and uh, we've got a yeah. teacher at Seventeen working uh, in that little group as well, which is really yeah. exciting. But we've yeah. just started with the language arts ones um, okay. for us. That's where we fit. And, and because it's part of our English block. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
I guess I'm also wondering what changes you've noticed in the teachers and the students since you've started doing work around knowledge. Well, um, it's students, it's, it's quite amazing because like I said, the Atus know more about Greek mythology than I do. Um, but their knowledge and their retention of knowledge is just so impressive because I think they've got the interest, um, they're engaged, um, and then they're applying it more to their writing, which is great to see. So our the con the the richness of our writing samples has definitely improved. Obviously, we you know you still have to have that big focus on actually teaching writing, the mechanics of writing. It doesn't do that. It just gives them the kind of topic and the knowledge and to for the content. Um, teachers have, or I I don't know if I'm just really lucky here, but they have absolutely just taken it on board and just run with it. They're amazing. I work with some very amazing staff. Um, but I think it's one of those things that teachers love to teach and you're teaching content that you're interested in as well. And it's actually a really exciting um, path to go down. It's it's fun for teachers to do. Um, so we've uh, had a very overwhelming positive uh, response based on going towards a knowledge. Um, uh, one teacher in particular said, you've just reinvig reinvigorated, you know, teaching for me and I'm, I'm absolutely loving it, which is, it's, it's nice to hear. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. And what do you think continue, like support your school to continue the work like this? So you, sort of when you start, just keeping that momentum and going. Yeah, that's, um, I guess you have to make it a priority and we revisit this in pretty much every staff meeting. Uh, even if it's not the whole staff meeting, you know, you've ever, schools are busy places, there's a million things to discuss in a staff meeting, but we, I have, or what we've implemented, sorry, is sharing successful practice sort of you know you know the conference on a mini mini scale in our staff meetings so uh different staff members for just five minutes that's all it is um beginning of the staff meeting presents on something that's going well in their classroom aligned to our obviously aligned to our direction and what the expectation is in our school planning documents and sharing that so that keeps the momentum for sure i think um making sure that we're always revisiting it in staff meetings and school development days um, I'm an instructional coach in the school, so I think um, it doesn't have to be a deputy. It can be like just having some sort of coaching model in the school. So people are having their lessons observed and they're getting feedback or they can observe other teachers and um, even that peer observation. That's really important as well because um, it, that sort of keeps the momentum and the growth um, growth going that way. Yep. Thanks. Um, if anyone has any last questions to ask and we'll just wrap up because the hour's over, it's just flown by. Thanks, Steph. It was um, so yeah, some really informa um, interesting information and I thought very useful and thank you so much for sharing all your you know, planning documents and experiences and things that you've done. Like it's, uh, I've got lots of ideas and I'm sure everyone else does as well. So we really do appreciate it. I think it. we all had our phones out taking yes. just some sneaky little snaps <laughs> of those planners. <laughs> I was clicking. Uh, we will soon be sharing those. We're sort of in the phase uh, at the moment of um, there, there's going to be empty bit like in year four and five we've just got empty knowledge units still and that's you know completely normal. It's going to take a long time I think to you know plan and um, revise um, the knowledge units, uh, but I'm absolutely happy to share everything we've made so far um, with that idea that, you know, it's not a perfect model. It's just where we are at the moment. Um, so I will put a link. Um, I'll share a link probably more at the end of the year once we've just gone through them a little bit more and um, added the feedback from people this term as well. Um, so I can send that link to you so, so you can share that out as well. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Sue or Reid, if you've got anything to add? No, I think we're all pretty, like, very inspired. I think the thing is, like, Steph, you talked about, um, and I commented in there, Reid was making a couple of comments too, you know, some of the things you touched on, both pedagogy and curriculum, like it's too, because you've got that really strong um, experience in pedagogy as well. So it's not, it's not just transforming what we teach, it's also how we teach. And that's a big change. It's a big yeah. change, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think having that, um, the explicit instruction, uh, well, the model across the school is actually probably an inf important first step because we've already, you know, we've had, our teachers have already had quite a lot of coaching in what explicit instruction is, what is checking for understanding and the engagement norms, um, which yeah. really means that the knowledge units you create are going to have more 
um, chance of success as well. So I think it's important to get those fundamentals right, making sure that you've got that instructional model down pat across the school. And I think that's what can be a bit daunting is looking at how much is in, for example, that core knowledge in one year, and yeah. it's at a pace that we're perhaps not as used to, but it's if you um, implement some of those um, pedagogical changes, then that they sort of go hand in hand, don't they? I've been thinking about that a little bit over this term because we've just really started to dabble in it. But I was going on, it, when you watch Brad's presentation, he has a good um, bit of a model where he gets the core knowledge units, goes and um, looks at the Australian curriculum, uh, the VIC curriculum, what we should be covering here, and then made the Docklands plan of what could go across. And of course, you leave out, you know, the bits yeah. of the Rushmore presidents and um, yeah, just, you know, the history of Canada. Well, I picked New Zealand instead. We were just sort of, you know, I was making our own model and it's just yeah. a lot to get through, but I was thinking about that if you really need to change the way you teach it. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Yeah, and prioritize, you don't need to go in, you know, choose some units that are interesting that are already there that can fit in, you know, some language arts ones maybe or, yeah. um, and that you can just have a go at first before yes. necessarily diving into every single unit, what should we cover in every year, just giving yes. teachers that chance to have a play and actually, you know, because it's actually, um, I was talking about it to one of my teachers today who's been, I don't know if she's on the screen here, but A, she commented at how, how much, you know, that we had, un you know, we underestimate the kids sometimes, how much they had learnt and retained and how amazing that was. That was the, um, the Roman unit, I think it's a year three one, um, but also about, you know, sometimes as teachers, we don't have that background knowledge. We're, we're having to read to keep up with yeah. uh, that's another little challenge too, is that sometimes teachers don't feel confident teaching things they don't have the knowledge in. Yeah, but when it's explicit, um, you're learning as they're learning as yeah. well. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Definitely help talking. Sorry, Kathleen. Now it's five thirty-six. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you so much, Steph. We'll share the recording when I've got it. So. Actually, Kathleen, can I give one little plug to what oh, we yeah. think? Oh, yeah. Steph? Sorry, I forgot. So you touched on, um, Steph, you touched on sharing best practice. We're looking at having a sharing. Now I've got the vacuum outside the room. Can you hear that? You had the drill. I've got the vacuum. Um, <laughs> we're looking at having a sharing best practice event in term one in Ballarat next year. So read Ballarat won't just be an hour. You know, that will sort of be our term one event oh, and it will no. be a whole day. So I hope everyone who's around the screen here will be interested in spending, um, which I'm sure you will because you love it as much as we do, um, a whole day, yeah, talking and thinking and learning um, about this sort of thing. Yeah, so that's exciting. Very exciting. Thanks, Steph. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. See you later.